This is True North Story, the original podcast series. Learn, love, listen, live. Are you ready to discover your True North Story? With your hosts, Tama Fulton and John Hudson Masserol. How was your morning show? Got through it. It's awful. Yeah. It's, it's just it's uh, it's just it just feels like a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So BJ, you uh, you New Jersey, right? Uh, actually, Massachusetts. Math close. Massachusetts, but close East Coast. You know, East we, Coast. we all get tiny lumped together. Little states there. Yeah. You know, you just drive from one to the other. Yeah, and... we all get lumped together because we're all just so charming <laughs> with a lovely positive of attitude. <laughs> Big Italian family. Yeah, uh, and I, I I was I was adopted, so I I know I wanted yeah. to ask you about that. Yeah, so Italian dad, adopted parent, Italian adopted dad, Italian I should say, Irish adopted mom. So in the Boston area, that's pretty much what it was because the Irish and the Italian came over and yeah. they hated each other when they were in Europe. But then they were like, oh wow, we're hanging out here, and so they did the unthinkable: the Irish and the Italians mixed and became families. What? So did you have you ever found or wanted Never to know have. your birth family? I've had a couple of private investigators think they could do it yeah uh and i have no birth certificate uh no record of me at all so they they couldn't find a thing they don't i'm, I'm a mystery i'm a mystery and everybody that was involved in the transaction they're all gone and dead like all the social workers and in the 60s they didn't even keep records i i, I had a, an astrologer say that they thought that i wasn't even born in september they think i'm more of a taurus so they but i don't know i said well i was uh, i wanted to play little league and i remember being with my dad at the uh place where you get birth certificates or supposed to figure this out yeah and they couldn't find it so they literally just took out a, a, a birth certificate and said all right let's just make it up here what do you want wow yeah so no holy way. cow yeah so it's like i don't know what i am i don't know who i am you gotta uh, do that dna test you know where you spit yeah. in the test tube well I, I like being a mystery if i don't do that then i can claim to be part of everything <laughs> that's true it's really great exactly yeah why why, why do i want to ruin it with facts <laughs> I could and be a blank slate, right? I'll be, exactly. I, I'll be like everybody that does past life regression. I'll just say I'm from this wonderful monarchy kingdom. I was a king or I was a this. Right. You, know. you could just make it up. <laughs> yeah. So what's the story? Did your parents find you on a doorstep? or? Uh, I actually literally was a doorstep baby. Wow. I was left on a, I was left on a church doorstep, like uh, literally like that. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really bizarre. It's such a it's such With a, a stereotype. Uh... I, I don't know if they left a note. I, I, I think I might have not. I, they might have just said, here it is. This <laughs> take. Take this away from me, whatever. Um, and yeah, so from oh, there, God. yeah, I uh, didn't talk until I was four, didn't walk until I was four, because I, I, I guess for the first 18 months of my life, little, just didn't have any interaction with whoever birthed me. So I was just kind of just chilling really? by myself. So I, yeah, so I, and I had bad eyesight. So that's why I didn't talk till I was four, because I couldn't see people very well. And I, you know, didn't have any interaction. Luckily, the, my adopted mother figured out that I had bad eyesight because they were wondering why I was so stunted in a lot of areas. And then she just noticed for some reason that there was a favorite toy near me and I was not happy. And she was like, well, this toy's right there. Why don't you just go get his toy? Then she put it in front of me, like right to my face. And then I saw it and I'm like, oh, cool. And then she's like, I think he's got eye problems. And then they gave me those cute little glasses they give all the little kids. Right. And right. then uh, as my sure. father, and my father said, as you guys will probably recognize, yeah, he didn't talk until he was four and then he hasn't shut up since. <laughs> <laughs> Had to make up, make it up for lost time. Exactly. When did you know that you wanted to have some kind of a career where you were speaking to people? Well, you know, I, uh, that's an interesting thing. I've always danced for my supper. Uh, I grew up in the 60s, and I just watched the movie Whiplash recently and that whole tough love thing. And it's a great movie because it takes that sort of abusive coaching. Mm -hmm. And I know what that abusive coaching is like because in the Northeast, where I grew up, that was pretty much how you were raised. You were just raised with the atmosphere of, what's wrong with you? What are you, stupid? What? And, and it was all tough love. <laughs> That's you know raised by a World War II vet, so uh -huh. and you know and it's an interesting thing to say, to realize that well I'm the where I'm the way I am because in my house I had to find a way to fit in 
I was the entertainer. That's what I. That's how I got positive attention, or I should say, I got less negative attention. Uh, Mom was a, at times a very angry person. I was able to calm her down with my antics. Uh, so I realized that was my bread and butter in life: is that I was the entertainer. I wasn't necessarily good at building things, and my dad was a builder. My brother was a builder kind of person, so I couldn't relate with them on that level. But I could, you know, I could joke around and do a song and dance and entertain, especially the women of the neighborhood and my family. So I said, all right, I guess uh, this may be the way I got to go. And uh, I started listening to radio shows and calling into radio shows when I was a young kid trying to win prizes and realized, hey, this 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 is kind of fun. I love what these guys do and had a dream at 15 that I could do this. And uh, here I am today. You know, it's, it hasn't wow. been an easy road, but it's a road. Right. At 15, you're thinking this is a cool gig. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, at 15, how do you? Who directed you? Who said, "Here's where you go. These are the next steps." Yeah, there wasn't. There was really nobody to do that uh, that I remember. Uh, my dad wasn't super supportive of it. My mom had already passed away uh, because it was a crazy idea. You know, sure. my dad was my dad was actually pretty smart. He saw the, the the advent of computers and how they would be important in business. And this was in the 70s. And he was like, "You need to learn computers." And I like playing computer games. I didn't want to design them. And I I was really I was just I was creative i thought i wanted to be an artist but i couldn't draw uh but i was but i had <laughs> which i found out the hard way i wish my art teacher told me right he let, he, let me bring, he let me bring this horrific portfolio that really looked worse than any hieroglyphic drawing and i would bring it into college <laughs> and they laughed they looked at me and they said are you serious you really think you're going to be an art student and I'm like, I don't know. My art teacher said I could be. Yeah. And I, then I realized my art teacher was entertained not by the drawing because I would do cartoons. He was entertained by the by the written part of the cartoons. Oh, uh-huh. so, the content. Yeah, the content. And so that's when I thought, all right, I need a new delivery system because the drawing is not working. <laughs> uh, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I, so I, and I discovered a college radio station, and that rekindled the idea of, oh, maybe I could do this. Uh, but they had no major or minor so it was a stumble i thought i wanted to work in supermarkets for a while but i realized it was all because it was the social part i wanted to be in the checkout area where the transactions took place because i felt that was the most important part but the supermarket thought that was the worst part and and so i just couldn't fit in i had too big of a mouth and eventually i was like i think this radio thing might be the only thing where i can get paid to be well, brass, uh, I should say brash, and I could get to be crass, and I could get to be uh, a questioning authority. And I also just wanted love, and I thought this would give me the love and adulation that I didn't think I was getting in my life, which, You've been well, sorely disappointed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, I was, I'm fortunate enough to have been in the career long enough to realize that that's not going to give it to me. Right. You know, that's so, I'm really happy that I've been in the business long enough to realize, oh, yeah, I'm not going to get any of this from this. <laughs> it took a while. Did you go to college? I, I went to college for a couple years, and then I went to, but from there I went right to a broadcasting school because that was, hey, in eight months, we'll put you on the radio. And I thought, yeah, the heck with the college so thing. So you I'm dialed gonna, 1-800, put uh, me on the yeah. air. Okay. And, and a few thousand dollars later, which back, you know, uh, 30 years ago, that's a lot of dough. Right. And I realized that's a great business for them. It was a wonderful business for them. <laughs> Uh, not such a college is a great yeah. business. Yeah, it surely is. Uh, surely is. I mean, you know, you look at you look at college costs, the rising amount of you know student debt and all the. I mean, that's a great gig, and they guarantee you nothing. Four years, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a piece of paper. Yeah, that's, there's your life. It's it's a sad you know? it's a sad thing because I you know in my dad's time a high school diploma was all you needed to have a great life, and I don't understand why that can't be the case anymore. I I, I don't know what's wrong with the system that you know you're just your 12 years doesn't get you a good life. If you want to, you know, be an amazing student or if you want to be mega rich or mega whatever, all right, I could see extended education in anything. That makes sense. Uh, but for doctors and lawyers and, 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 and you know, and, and bright people, that's what I always thought college was for. And now it's a necessity that, like you said, guarantees nothing except a, a ridiculous amount of debt. Yeah. You get that four-year degree and you're in competition with everybody else. That's why when you fall, you know, in a capitalist society, you go, wow, this doesn't seem right. Why is this 
why is this seam broken? Oh, money. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's the that's the <laughs> ticket. Okay. Yeah. Uh, luckily for me, this is a performance based industry, and they don't care about your piece of paper. They care about the ratings. Yeah. So, and right. I've, I've had people that went to really really good schools. One one really good school was Emerson in Boston Broadcasting School. I've had friends that I came up with in the business. They're not in the business, and I remember them thinking, "I went to Emerson. You went to a stupid broadcast school for eight months." Why are you in the business and I'm not? A lot of yeah. it is just who you are, right? You discovered that. Well, that it's just if you can perform. If you can perform. And if you can put up with it, because a lot of people won't put up with the, you know, just like anything in life. You know, it's a fun job, but there's a lot at, at this job that's not fun. And, you know, I moved around the country and I don't get to have that family life uh, that the average person does. And I didn't get to save my money like the average person does. Uh, <laughs> it, it, there's a lot of pitfalls. And, and so it has its pluses and minuses and usually the minuses will get rid of the people that don't love it you know you have to really love art and people who get mm-hmm. into art for fame and fortune uh, they can be somewhat successful but it's really empty and a lot of people fall away because they go for the fame and the fortune and it's really no that's not what keeps you in art it's the passion it's the passion yeah. to you know yeah. f- for me you know I th- for love baby <laughs> <laughs> well with so many people it, you know it starts out as passion and then it becomes a business and that's when it becomes much more difficult for artists to continue to create content because now the love is gone because they have to, because they have to, right? Because now they're tremendously successful or they're this big star and they've got to crank it out. And it's like, well, how do I get back to where that passion was that I wrote in the beginning when I was starving and broke, but I really loved what I was doing. And now I'm, you know, uh, now I've become this incredibly successful person and I have to crank it out and it's, it's become a job. So, so let me ask you this, BJ, how much, you, you mentioned it being a performance. How much of it is you, what you bring to the microphone? How much of it is you and how much of it is, uh, your persona or alter ego or a combination thereof and, Kind of, uh, how do you balance and manage that? I would say that it, it all starts from me because, I mean, I, I am me. So whatever I do, it's filtered through me and my life experiences. Though, uh, I will say, though, the, the B.J. Shea character, in order for him to be as good as he is, in order for me to be able to go on every day and consistently do a great show, it the character has to be well-defined and has to be well-known so that it can be successful. Because a real human being, just a regular person, doesn't have the answer to everything, isn't able to respond to something without even thinking, you know, because it's such a high-stress, ridiculous environment to do any sort of performance. Uh, especially live improv every day of the week. So the great ones, right. I, I studied the great ones and realized, oh, yeah, they're totally a character, and they've created such a great character and really worked at it and honed it and studied movie actors and Broadway actors and, and just people in television. You realize, okay, they've got this character down to the point where, you know, especially like on the actor's studio where I love sometimes where Lipton will ask a question of the actor, then ask a question of the character. And when you right. get such different answers, I said, that's where I want to be in my field. I want to have BJ to be such a different character that uh, I, he's almost unrecognizable from how I am if you're just hanging out with me. And so, yeah, it's it's now I would say the character is is completely different than me. Though there were years where I got lost in the character because I just I lost my passion, lost my way, didn't have a didn't really seek out good mentors. And so I was really doing it on my own. Uh, Also stopped learning. I mean, there was a moment in my career where I'm like, oh, wow, I did everything people said you're not supposed to do to be successful and didn't realize I was doing that. And (laughs) wow. Yeah. You know, when you're young, you're right. When you're young and you're in your 20s, you have that passion. You know, you want to it's the time to come up with dreams and then go out and make them happen. When you get to your 50s, you realize it's not dream time anymore. You, you mm. just don't have that right. anymore. So then what what makes you passionate? And luckily, I was able to have people just go and say to me, go, are you still learning? Do you still have mentors? Are you st-? And it's like, no, no, I, I know everything, don't I? I'm 50. I know everything. I don't need to learn <laughs> anything anymore. And uh, luckily, I was able to find a, a good bunch of people. And now I know how to get passion. I know how to bring passion to every part of my life which is something I accidentally did in my 20s. Now I get to do it intentionally anytime, anywhere I want. That's what keeps me going. Now I realize, whoa, everything's a stage. I don't have to be mad about whatever job I have. 
because I will make it great. Give me what I just give me a stage and I will make whatever this is great, which is an attitude I never had before. So it's kind of cool to live from that place. You got that passion got reignited somehow. Yeah. And and it is just continue learning, you know, for like I like, oh yeah, let me read some new stuff I don't know. And luckily my wife is so different than I am. And so she's into all these different spiritual traditions from the East. And I used to just sit and look at her and say, Who are you? Because I'm such a a, a Western scientist pragmatist. And now <laughs> but now everybody seems to be sort of joining the same road. You've got psychologists and behavioral scientists saying, you know, those yogis that came over from India, like you know, Yogananda, they were onto something, but right. they were able to explain it in a language I can understand. So now I'm getting it. My wife's been trying for years to tell me her point of view, but she couldn't really articulate it because her language was different than mine. Now there's some bridges being built language wise where us sciencey people can really see spirituality and understand how it works now. And it's not just snake oil anymore. It's like they're both coming together realizing. Oh wait a second! You know this the science there's of some religion science in this stuff, and there's some religion in science and yes. science. In, so it's I love that because it's just a matter of being diligent, saying I'm going to figure out a way to see what my wife's talking about, keep this relationship going, and now we're kind of we're, we're we were on these separate roads, and it was so funny how we're coming in from different exits on the same freeway, and we're both very surprised because she's like, I can't believe you're kind of getting this, and I'm like, yeah, and I. I can't believe that uh, that you're getting that I'm getting this. <laughs> and we're wow. in completely different places, you know. She's sitting there doing her meditation, and I am not a meditation guy, but I am going about it my way to get to that place of loving humanity, loving what is, doing it from a type A personality. When you're type B, hey, go, hey, meditate. Well, yeah, you can do that. When you're type A, how do you, it's a whole. How do you relax? I want to be get type there? Yeah, I want to be frenetic, frantic. And at peace, because because that's a place too. you know, being a type A is a place. Right. I don't want to have to be type B to be happy because why can't I be happy as type A? And why can't type B be as happy as type B? We know what type B's did. They went they took cocaine. That's how they got to be. Type a. That's it. That's it. Right. I don't want to have to take Valium to be happy. I want to be able to be like this. I want to be like this and be as much peace as my wife is. Yeah. And I think uh, I think I figured it out since the, the everyone's starting to really communicate and speak to the same thing. I'm like, oh, all right. I'm cool the way I am. And yeah, you meditate that way. I meditate this way. Uh, as long as I I get what's up. In the times we're living in now, I think that desire for peace is going to become more and more prevalent because it's kind of crazy right now. You know, what what, what we're seeing uh, out not only here domestically, but globally. And I think people w want more peace or, or want a way to find that or try and incorporate that into their own lives. Just a, a way to get off the, the exit once in a while and breathe. Well, it's, you know, it's really funny because I, I, my wife uh, and, and, and my wife said, hey, I, I, I watched this uh, this movie called Awake, by uh, which is the life story of Yogananda, a dude that came over from, uh, from India and in the 20s and started telling us about a whole different way to look at religion and science. And at the end, George Harrison's song, Give Me Peace, is playing. And I looked at my wife, I said, well, you know, I always thought he was saying, give me peace in the world, but now I get what he's saying. He just wants peace. And I realized, oh, right. right. If everybody says, give me peace, and it's just they want peace, that's the way the world gets to be peaceful. I don't got to go make the world peaceful. I just make myself right. peaceful. And if somehow, some way, my example can help somebody else get them peaceful, then it's that ripple effect. And it's not such a daunting task anymore. Because when you globalize it and go, oh, my God, look at the world. But, right, in, right. but in reality, the world's been the world. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's not changing. There's it's always, not changing. No. There's, <laughs> there, you know, there's always a Jesus. There's always a yoga. Now, there's always somebody that has some cool stuff that... That, you know, people can be spoken to because, look, it's unfortunately the, the one thing that's similar with the Hitlers of the world and let's say the Gandhis of the world is they're speaking to people that are upset looking for answers. Yes. And so yep. the one thing about Gandhi was like, well, here's what I can tell you. The violence just creates more violence. That's the, that was the one different thing that he said that the Hitlers of the world didn't get. Is like, yeah, you're right. Something's got to be done. It's just we can't violently do anything. That's not going to do it. It never will do it. And I look at it and think, oh, I finally get what Gandhi's talking about. It's, uh -huh. oh, he's like, yeah, it's just not going to work. And I'm, I'm kind of a smart guy. I go, well, I really don't want to do stuff that doesn't work. 
It's not that I'm Mr. Peaceful. I just don't want to do something that doesn't work. It's a waste of time. And I, right. and that's right. what, yeah. And that's that's the cool thing about humanity is oh, and it, and it's really just about empowering people and then seeing how people are disempowered, and then usually it's folks that are fearful that disempower even the most rich and most powerful people. If they're doing some weird stuff, it means oh, they got some stuff going on. You know, I, I'm not a big, I'm not a believer in evil. I'm a believer in people that are messed up, and then because they're messed up, they do things that can be hurtful. Because uh, everyone's right. the hero, everyone's a hero of their own stories. So I, I just know, hey, people are messed up. But this whole good versus evil has been used to manipulate the world, and it's sad. But you know, I think that uh, there are people out there going, "No, there's there, there's another way." Now wait a minute, for a geek like you, who's yes. like huge like Star Wars and Star Wars, Star Trek, Star anything. Yes, yeah. There is a very <laughs> very there's a defining line of good and evil. So how do you d- explain that? Well, I'll tell you, it's an interesting thing, and I love art. You know, I love lo- I love art because at the end of the day, all of these are, are artistic expressions. Whether you know you a movie, a book, anything. So Gene Roddenberry, who created Star Trek said, yeah, I'm not going to lecture anybody about politics. Just watch my shows. And if you watch the shows enough, you see what is perceived as evil. And I'll give the perfect example of the Klingons. The Klingons in the original series were always the enemy. Next generation comes around, not enemies anymore. They found a way to make peace because they realized the Klingons weren't evil. The Klingons were just passionate. They love fighting. They're, they're, think about boxers and mixed martial artists. Think about any of the passionate cultures that we have where they just aren't going to live blandly. That is really what they flushed out. So the original Klingons, we didn't understand. We just knew these are these guys that fight and they want to hurt everybody, which is kind of what we were in the early stages of America. We just had an us versus them. But now we go, wait a minute, wait a minute. What are they really like? Well, maybe we don't understand their culture, but let's understand why this is important to them. And then we realize, oh, they're not evil. That's just how they live their life. That's what they find joy in. And I love that Star Trek did that. They took a, they took the enemy, flushed them out, and gave them a beautiful, rich culture to the point that they, somebody made up an entire language that yeah. is a, a full-blown Klingon language right, that is loved right. by all. And it's because they showed the other side. It wasn't two-dimensional. They went three-dimensional. And you talk about that, Tama. So all of a sudden, we go from, hey, good versus evil, and then Gene Roddenberry, Roddenberry's winking, going, or are they evil at all? Or are we good at all? There's a great show called Farscape that flipped the script, and they had a, a bunch of people called the Peacekeepers, and we looked at a bunch of rogue runaways. The Peacekeepers were the Federation. It was just their way to show, you know, you got a Federation keeping peace in the galaxy with their big starships and their weapons, and they say they're on a mission, but they, they're able to keep everybody in line. Uh. That sounds very Nazi-like, and so the creators of this Farscape show decided, we're going to show the other side of what a Federation could be. And I thought that was brilliant, because now the, the people that were good have now become the evil guys, and you're rooting for the so-called evil guys. They're the good guys on the show. And then when the show ends, you don't realize, hey, I was just rooting for, could be the evil Guys. Well, you know, you root for understanding is really what they do. If, if it's a good show, whether it be anything, whether it be, I mean, Game of Thrones is beautiful for this because, my God, they really allow you to look at everything that's happening that has happened. And you sit there and you go, I don't know who to root for. Right. But I, I'll tell you this. What I love about Game of Thrones is there's probably three characters that folks would argue are the top three nicest people that you would take a bullet for, if you will, in the <laughs> show. Top three. So you'd think they're the most wise, most loving, most big hearted. Jon Snow is a character who is beloved on that show. And he absolutely we're so glad he's back. too. Yeah. And so think about the yeah. message that he keeps getting. And this is the beautiful thing about philosophy. Out of anybody on that show, he's the last guy you think someone should keep telling him over and over again that he knows nothing. You'd think that so many other people on Game of Thrones, they would give that. I think Cersei probably a couple times could have had that message. She, yeah, absolutely. But it was Jon right. Snow that kept getting the message, you know nothing, Jon Snow. And I keep th- and it reminded me of the beginner's mind. It's like the lesson for somebody to be amazing and be a master is to, to have beginner's mind, which is you know nothing. When you go into it like that in life... That's where passion comes back again. That's Mm. where excitement comes back again. And I'm thinking, these guys at Game of Thrones, they're doing the beginner's mind. Look what they're doing. Ah, that's why I love art. That's why art is so amazing. It's it's just so wonderful. And a show that people wouldn't expect it. They just would go, Game of Thrones, I'm not going to watch that. It's nudity and what's all these swords and dragons. Loser show. (laughs) 
Right. Okay, so that was number one. Who's two and three? Who's two and three? Well, uh, you got to think Daenerys. Okay. And Tyrion. Right. Okay. Those three, because Tyrion, what an amazing negotiator for a guy that nobody should take seriously. And let's remember, <laughs> he's considered a, an abomination and a freak show, and he still has maintained more heart, more pragmatism. And then, of course, there's Daenerys, who has gone through ridiculousness, and yet at the same time, she has mobilized everybody. Uh, those, right. the, 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 it's a, if you want to be a great human, you look at those three characters and realize that it's all necessary to have, uh, I would say, a great community, society, world. You need all of what the three of them bring to the table, just as how they be in life. And they're not perfect. That's what I love. None of them are perfect. One's a bastard. One's an imp. And the other one is, uh, you know, uh, her father was a crazy person, and she was kicked out of the kingdom and had a brother that was an a-hole. And look what she's done. Although she can ride dragons, well, which is you know, pretty impressive. It just goes to <laughs> give somebody enough time, and they'll get to see how amazing they are. Are. Because when we first met Daenerys, she you didn't think anything was going to come of her unless, of course, you know, I love the I, I, lo I love uh, Amelia Clark because she showed you, oh, my God, just with her performance. There's more here than what right. they're presenting, which you got to give. I love great acting uh, because of that. So I'm a, I, yeah. love, I just love art. I'm a video guy. So I love movies and television. And that's inspired me in my life because there's so much great artwork out there. Yeah, there's a lot of crap, but there's so much great art out there. True North Stories meant to inspire, encourage, motivate, and offer hope. And now, back to the program. That brings up an interesting question I wanted to ask, BJ. What, what, how do you see that culture now, the art part of it? Uh, are we better? Are we worse? Are we telling more incredible character-driven stories? Are you seeing less of that? Because Tam and I discussed this vociferously on many occasions about the quality of the art that we are or are not getting today. Well, I believe is I've seen it uh, get better and better and better because I have been such a TV guy, movie guy my entire life and the quality of performance the quality of commitment the quality of writing when, when you find a good show i mean look right. there's a, there's there's a, a lot right. out there yeah there's a lot out there but then again that's the way it's always been in life you know there's been trashy books they you know there's right. been trashy performances right. look at your uh, art portfolio i mean there's been trashy oh, art that's a know. fact i mean <laughs> I, I did not contribute positively in the world of art in that respect at all uh and even in the business even in the business i'm in uh there's there, there's just just people out there with big mouths that aren't tr going trying to do something deeper with what they're doing. If you have a multi-leveled presentation, that's what I love. When I when I you know sit there and maybe do the deleted scenes or listen to the uh, the uh, the commentary and realize, oh, I had no idea that they were thinking that. Like I missed all of that. That's that right. to me is that to me is tremendous. And in the world of television, I love that a show like The Walking Dead, wh where you know if you look at it, you would you could dismiss it, and yet there's nothing. I've seen in such a long time that shows how humanity would perform under pressure. It is, and that is what a, what a tremendous uh, uh, contribution to the world of art, watching those performers. And, of course, they get a lot of British actors because for some reason they, I don't know why they act better than us Americans, but they just seem to. <laughs> Could be the Shakespearean training. I don't know what it is. Right. Uh, uh, that show is a wonderful show uh, that I've really been digging lately as far as drama. Of course, Game of Thrones. I just see the things that I'm, that I, you know, that, 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 they, have, they have companion talk shows. That's right. the other cool thing is like the, right. the the Chris Hardwick that the Talking Dead just about one TV show. BJ, did you catch any of of the vinyl series? I uh, I, I, have, uh, I haven't curious. I haven't seen the vinyl series. Uh, I heard good stuff about it. It, it wasn't. It, you know, it's funny. It doesn't hit me like that world of music. I'm one of those weird people where music I like it, but I have horrible taste, and I'm not. It doesn't touch me the way video does because I mean, Steve, my partner on the show, loves music, and so he watched vinyl. And our program director, Dave, also a lover of music. And so they really, really loved it. I uh, I watch so much. We parse out and, and and say, okay, you take care of this. I'll take care of that. Okay. Um, but I mean, I've heard I've heard great things about it. It was different. Uh, there were episodes that were off the charts, amazing. Yeah. And then there were episodes where you could tell it was written by somebody else, and they were just trying to kill time. 
And what the one consistent that I think Tim and I would both agree was the music as a, another character in the show, yep. music from that era. Yeah. And it was really powerful. And the selections of songs that they chose were wonderful. They weren't the same ones that have been pounded over and over in television and movies. So there was some there was some learning there of some musical acts and things that were like, wow. And the timing all synced up. It was really interesting historically. And it was interesting from a business perspective to see how radio interacted with the record companies. I think that part of it was really interesting. I don't know where it's going to go season two. It kind of limped out in the finale. It, it, does give you, it does give you a great appreciation when you have all those cooks in the kitchen, when you see a success, to think, how did they, with all the cooks in the kitchen, right. were they able to sync up and make a great product? Because, yeah, you see what happens so often when they don't. You know, if you, yes. I had one friend that did a television show for... For ABC, uh, he, when he first started, he had a lot of control, and then all of a sudden, more cooks came in, and it just watered down yep. the vision, and and the show got canceled. And I feel badly for him because it wasn't his show that got canceled. That's somebody else's idea. Yeah, his name is on it, and the and these cooks, you never get to see them. You know, may nobody ever sits through and looks at all the producers and whoever. So you just you never. That's that's why, man, when it works, you think, whoa, who are these special? <laughs> Like Louis C.K. now yeah. has an internet web show, and it's called Horace and Pete, and he he has so many actors that that they don't get paid much. It doesn't because he it it, it doesn't cost much to do, and he can, and he can't really afford to do it for much more money than he does. But because Louis does such great work. They want to work with him. So all of a sudden, Alan Alda and Steve Buscemi and Edie Falco, uh, you know, and Laurie Metcalf, are all, they're all making appearances on a show that it's a web show. It shouldn't they shouldn't have the budget to be able to do it. And they don't have the budget. But these actors are like, this is art. I want to do this. They have the passion. And it's a yeah. it's a beautiful show where Alan Alda plays a modern day Archie Bunker. It is brutal. But at the same time, you actually can see his side of the story uh, to have somebody utter the racist homophobic misogynistic things he utters but at the same time say hey i treat everybody the same and i think you're the same as me and to think that that both and a sort of existence i mean there was a there was a thing about african americans on that show where alan alda was using the n-word prof- profusely but when people wow. gave him a hard time about using the n-word he kept saying F you. We had people at this bar. We didn't care what color your skin was. And then he just said, we let this uh, racial epithet. We let that racial epithet. We let them all in and charged them the same at a time where nobody would do that. So say he said, don't call me a racist. And I and it was a right. beautiful performance because it's like in this country, we really look at words. We don't look at we don't look at what's behind those words, what's really going on. And I'm thinking, boy, Louie knocked it out of the park. And this is on a web show that you have to buy and pay to see. But, man, there's some beauty there. There's some great art on that show. Louis C.K., is he might, be the, he might be the comic writing genius of our generation. I mean, the way people thought about Norman Lear, I'm thinking that Louis C.K., if, if, if he isn't already there, is on his way. Yeah, it's, it's just, I mean, Alan, wow. Alan Alda, I've never seen Alan Alda like this. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And really, he's amazing. He wanted Joe Pesci for the role, and he almost got Joe Pesci out of retirement for this role, but Joe is, I, I think he's pretty much done with acting and all of Hollywood and everything, but he got Alan Alda. Boy, I can't imagine anybody but Alan Alda doing this role. You and wow. I had a discussion. The characters, Mo Curley. Oh, no, I mean, no, Mo, Larry, Mo, Larry and Curley? Mo, Larry and Curley. Oh, oh, the Three Stooges, yes. Oh, so ahead of their time. Amazing. Right. So ahead of their tell, time. Tell John about that conversation that we had and who they represented, because it made perfect sense to me once we talked about that. Well, I, I you know, I, you take a look at something that endured and when i was growing up in the 70s they were on they were rerunning all those old movie shorts and of course the three stooges were not well regarded i mean they were the little movie before the real movie that everybody wanted to see uh, before abbott and costello before the marx brothers you had to you had to sit through this three stooges in many people's eyes lowbrow comedy and in my team I mean, i'm a teen kid growing up 15 years old everybody in my age group we watched the Three Stooges. How could something from the 30s be so uh, enamoring to 
kids of the 70s. And that's exactly what happened. And they were do they were so ahead of their time. They were doing stuff that really appealed to us. They were it was amazing. I mean, this is 40 years ago. Black and white television, you know, stuff that doesn't even I mean old cars and they didn't even I mean houses weren't even fully wired for electricity yet. And we're watching this, loving it every afternoon. The performances, the sound. I To this day, I don't think sound effects and audio ha- have been as good as what was on the Three Stooges. They really did a great job with the audio of that uh, of that show. And Mo, Larry, and Curly, my gosh, they were they took a beating. I mean, they did all their own slapstick, and they they really hurt themselves doing it, but they, they made it realistic. They were clever, at least clever for the 70s. They might not have been clever enough for the 30s, but they really were clever for the 70s. <laughs> and frankly, uh, you know... Each one of them, in your mind, Phil, Philosophically represented a part of society. Oh, that's and that is so. Yeah, you're absolutely right. They really did because when everybody was, you know, in the musicals of of, of, of Abbott and Costello and the, and the and the Marx Brothers, it was all about trying to basically say, look, we know the world sucks, we're the world's at war, but we're going to sing and dance, and hopefully people will think this illusion is true. And the Three Stooges weren't that. I mean, they showed what life was really like for the average American, especially the Great Depression. They were losers. The trouble was. Everybody was a loser. Nobody was the Marx Brothers. Nobody right. was Abbott and Costello. They all had great lives. The Three Stooges didn't have a great life off screen, really, and on screen. And so Mo represented the, you know, he represented the guy that thought he was more important than he was, <laughs> a stupid guy mm-hmm. that thought he was smart. Larry surely looked like somebody who was medicating. And I really believe it was all about, hey, man, I'm going to check out of the world. And it's like Larry was a stoner before stoners were around. And if you watch Larry, <laughs> with a stoner's mind, you'll realize, oh yeah, that guy looked like he was stoned all the time. This is hysterical. And then Curly, Curly was, he was just the foil. Like, he was basically the whipping boy, the fall guy, the sacrificial lamb. And boy, that yeah. was that was pretty much everybody in America. I mean, when you think about what our government always put us into and all the crap that went down and the depression, world wars, all the stuff. I mean, pretty much Americans were curly and we were told to buck up and get through it. And yet really we were all curly. We were all everybody's whipping boy. I thought that was so wonderful for the time. And of course, Nobody wanted to see it because it was truth. Nobody wants truth. That right. show was truthful. It wasn't pretty. They weren't, you know, they, they they weren't attractive. It wasn't glamorous. And even the songs they did, they they poked fun at that world and it wasn't well received. It wasn't well received because nobody wanted to face the truth of what the world was because the world was horrific at the time. Right. And yeah, I get it. You had to get through it by sort of singing and dancing and faking your way through. Or you could get your way through life by looking at the truth and living with it rather than avoiding it, which, again, how many philosophies tell us to do that? And the Three Stooges were saying, this is it. Right. This is the truth. This is what's happening now, not what everybody else is showing you. I think that's why as a kid of the 70s. I wanted truth, and I still had parents that were not wanting to be truthful, put everything under the rug, don't talk about divorce. You know, I had a cousin that was divorced, and they treated her like crap, and it's like, she had an abusive husband. Why are we being mean to her? She didn't ask for this. Right. She got divorced. Right. You know, like like she's persona non grata. Like she was the black sheep. Yeah, right. and so my generation was like, no, I don't like that. No, that's not how we're going to live. And the Three Stooges showed us people from that time that, no, they weren't. Dry. They weren't covering it up. They were losers because that was that's where a lot of Americans were at that time, you know, poverty and really not doing well. Uh, I, and I, I loved it. They made fun of people that pretended that it wasn't true and that they were better than they were. And I just that's what I got out of it anyway. And that's what you love about the Alan Alda character you were talking about. Because he's not a bad guy. He's not. He's speaking just what's on his mind. He's like, here's what I'm about. But. He also understands. Uh, he he understands. He's got a method to his madness. They, 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 like they like they, they, they turned out in one episode that he was watering down the, the alcohol, and so they came in, in his bar in his bar. And so one of the, the the person that was assessing it said, "You can't do that. That's illegal." He goes, "You have to tell these people." He goes, "I'm not going to tell these people." He goes, "Look." Why do you think these people could come in every day and drink and not have a drinking problem? If we served them full strength alcohol, they'd all be alcoholics. I have I, that's I, I, that would be irresponsible of me to do that. So I don't give. And they said, so the, 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 but they said, you're no, that's wrong. <laughs> so he turned to everybody in the bar. He goes, hey, everybody, just so you know, I've been watering down your drinks for thirty years. A couple of people go, I knew it, and then went right back to their drinks. Wow. He's he, there is a there is there is a wisdom. That we don't want to see because it's ugly. 
Yes. And that's the way humanity has, parts of humanity have always been. And now we're hiding behind political correctness because as long as it looks pretty, we don't want to. And if anybody doesn't look pretty to us, in other words, they say the wrong thing, Mm -hmm. then they're ugly and wrong. And it's like, no, let's look at beyond that. Okay. What are they really saying? What are they really doing? Uh, I I think Alan Alda's portrayal is fantastic. I think he's showing everybody in the world of political correctness. uh, Hold on a second. He charges people different prices. And they finally, somebody said, why are you charging me a different price? He goes, because you came in here, you're some, he goes, you're a douchebag that came in here because it's a hipster thing to do, and you've got money. These people come here every day. I, they don't have the money. So, yeah, you're paying double the price. <laughs> and it's oh, funny. That's great. You know, and the, the person looked at him and he said, oh, yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah, fair okay. enough. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. And he, and, and he said something like, what? and that's what you people do anyway. You pay double the price because you think you're getting a great time when they charge you double the price. So here, come to our stupid bar that you think is stupid. You think we're losers. You pay double to be in this loser bar for your loser bar experience. And they're like, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It's, oh, that's uh, great. I, I, I love it. It's, and Louie does that. Louie, oh, he does that so, so well. Does that so well. Uh, he's addressed so many different things going on in society today. And rather than lecture, he ends up taking a beating like, what's going on? Why is this happening to me? And it's all the horrible stuff going on in society. But Louis has to go through the lens of, oh, here I am. I'm getting, I'm getting it again. And, mm. and, then he gets, and then he gives the other side, which I think is amazing. He, see, he gives the other perspective as to why maybe it's okay that this happened to him, which is beautiful. Art showing every side. Holy, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it just jazzes yeah. me up. It, it jazzes me up and makes me excited to then go do what I do in life, whatever the heck that might be. Which is keeping everybody entertained uh, every morning. You get up at three, four. I get. I'm lucky now because we we have a a, a, a big enough staff that I can get up at four thirty, which is a nice wow. thing. Yeah, I mean they have to get up earlier. So, but that's the that's the beauty of of you know being in the business as long as I have. I you young kids, you know what? When you get to be my age, you can get up at four thirty. <laughs> you get up at three, you little sons of guns. So you have got a couple of kids that are. Yep. <laughs> They're part of this uh, shit uh, you've know, got going on. I know. Uh, it's, it's, it's bittersweet. I mean, I get to see them because a lot of times at their age, they're off doing their own thing. Sure. And maybe if you're lucky, you get a family dinner once a month. Now that they work with me, I see them every day, uh, which is nice, especially my son who, you know, I don't know if I'd ever see him. He's kind of, a, you know, he's, he <laughs> does he's, his own thing. Yeah, huh? he does his own thing. And um, it's bittersweet because I, then I work with them and... I, it's it's I want to keep my distance as a parent because this is a professional environment. So I've created enough systems where I don't they don't have to answer to me. But it's tough for me because I you know want them to do well, right? And I think I know what that means. I really don't. You know, every parent thinks they know, but I really have no clue. <laughs> uh, so I have to control that. But it's 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 a fun thing and. It's also hard. I didn't want to in- inconvenience anybody in the workplace by, you know, oh, they're the, 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 the boss's kids. Therefore, we're not, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little unfair. So they couldn't work here unless everybody was on board. And I, I, I told everybody, I said, look, if you don't like them, they don't work here. Uh-huh. That's how it is. They interned. They went through the whole process. You know, I've seen it in other businesses. You know, just I knew my kids weren't going to be nine to fivers. I know what my wife is like and I know what I'm like. And it's hard to fit into the nine to five world. Mm. Everybody tells you you're supposed to do that. My kids both had trouble in school because school is about making nine to fivers. Yes. And they uh, the cookie cutter kids. Yeah. They're just and, and art is is in, in certain places is just not really regarded in society right now. It's all about making money and tech and Art is always going to be needed. That's why I'm surprised when schools don't devote more time to it. You always want to be entertained. You always need art. So I I don't understand why that's not pushed more. But uh, luckily for us, we knew it about our kids, so we were able to help them through the travails of that. I grew up in a household since I was adopted. They didn't know. I, none of my DNA was anywhere to be seen. Therefore, they didn't get me. They didn't understand it because my mother and my father adopted. They weren't artists. They were workers. And they were right. hard workers. My, you know, my dad worked in a sugar refinery throwing 100-pound bags of sugar on a train. He was a laborer. He loved working with his hands. So this, this da 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 his son, he's just like, what is this? And how are you going to make a living doing uh-huh. this? Didn't understand. Right. No, and I and I can't blame him. I, he just had no frame of reference. There was nowhere in his own family he could look and see an example. So that's why I'm happy my kids... They got us because we we both you got know. it. My wife doesn't want to work because she doesn't like the world of work. 
She was just like, oh, yeah, this is horrible. This whole capitalist society and this working thing. Oh, yeah, I want no part of it. So she meditates and does her yoga and, and studies. Yeah, she, and, and that's great. Yeah, that's her thing. And she's actually doing more work now in her life than she ever did because she works for this, this Asian energy healer. And she's in charge of a lot of stuff for him. And she said, I never wanted to be part of the work world. And here I am part of the work world because she's doing all the crappy stuff. And I said to her, I said, well, the reason you put up with it is because you love it. You finally found something you love. That's the only reason anybody puts up with all the garbage. Just like, oh, that's why I do what I do. I said, right. You know, because there's right. a, lot of, a lot of crap. So I'm happy for her that she's doing that. She raised the kids. She, she helped me in my career as she took care of the family. And every time we moved every two years, she did it. And she was a trooper. So now it's the stage of her life where she gets to do what she wants which is even like she lives in a different state. It's like a, it's a long distance relationship so she can pursue her her passion. So I know where the apple's going to fall. <laughs> okay. I knew my kids were not going to be nine to five kids. They were going to be artists and very creative. I've taught both of them to embellish for the show and create characters. So I don't know if I'm hearing about Sarah like herself or if I'm hearing about the character <laughs> she's created. Okay. She's been cuz she's been a, she's been singing and dancing and acting since she was 5. So she understands performance, which is a reason why I brought her in. I thought that she would really be good. She's really quick. Because right. improv performance is not easy for people to master. Um, and But she was really always quick on her feet. She could hold her way in a conversation whether she knew what she was talking about or not. When I brought her on board, I said, okay, so he, here's a character. What do you think of this character you get to play? She's quite shy. And she can be outspoken at times, but she's really a good worker, falls in line. When the mics are off, she kind of is dutiful and will sit in the corner and not spo speak until spoken to. Really not who she is on air. So I don't know how much of it is embellished and how much of it is her real life. Okay. That's the beauty of it. Aha. Uh -huh. That's how I'm able to go to sleep at night. Because she is quite social, this character. She, yeah, and I love it because she's a woman doing what she wants, and some feminists are having a hard time with it, especially women who are in their 50s, because my daughter is acting in a way that they fought at being pigeonholed. Ah. But my daughter says, I can do anything I want, including this. So why can't I? And now some of those women in their 50s, their brains can't get around it. Like, why would you want to act like a person who's objectified? And my, daughter's, my daughter only knows a world where she can do what she wants. There's no limits to whatever she, she can work. She cannot work. She can be prim and proper. She cannot be prim and proper. She won't be judged either way in her brain. Her generation's like, yeah, whatever. And she has friends that are from all walks of life in her generation. Right. They don't know anything but, oh, yeah, good on you, girl. You want to be an exotic dancer? You want to be a banker? You want to be a tech person? You want to be a scientist? It's all cool to them. Some of the older women are tripping because they're like, yeah, banker, scientist, that's okay. Exotic dancer, no! And <laughs> I love that my daughter is teaching them something because, again... In the world of philosophy, it's all cool. Life is what it is. Yep. It's, you know, once we start putting limitations and conditions, we suffer. Nobody else does, but we suffer when we put conditions on anything. You know, so that's that's a good lesson for all of us. It is a great lesson, and that's part of what we are trying to do at True North Story is to help people find that passion yeah. and hear about the journey that they took because sometimes you're an exotic dancer before you're a scientist. Sometimes you're a scientist before you're an exotic dancer. You know, it's all part of the journey. It really is. It's all part of the tapestry, which I, I'll, I'll steal from a Star Trek The Next Generation episode, because if people think, if I could just get rid of some of these loose ends on this rug I have of my life, it would be perfect. But once one starts unraveling all those loose ends, the entire rug falls apart. And that's when one realizes, oh, my gosh, I should have left well enough alone. That was a good rug. We're right where we're supposed right. to be, you know, that there is no wrong thing that happened because I don't I'm not where I am if I didn't do everything I did. And sure, I'm sad about some things I did. And I sometimes will feel shame about some things I did. Uh, but in my good moments, I'm like, I had to do that. I'm not here if I didn't do that. And if I think I'm cool where I am now, then I have to love where I was then because that's what got me where I am now, which is. You well, know, that's the true, you know, that's, that, that's, that's, that's the true thing. north. That's the true north. And that's pretty deep. It is. It's, it, you know, loving oneself is the key to world peace. Because at the end of the day, nobody does anything miserable unless they're miserable. I mean, they, misery loves company. It's true. And it's the company of miserable activities within my own miserable feeling. That's what I attract to myself. And... Whenever I'm in the best mood ever, I never think of doing anything miserable. Anybody. Even the worst people in the world did something nice for somebody when they were in a good mood. 
<laughs> or, or they thought they did. Right. And that's why this good versus evil thing is probably the worst tenant introduced to mankind ever. It's, I understand why they did it. They thought it was a great way to control people. And at the time, they thought, hey, we need to control people. But whenever one needs to control somebody with, with uh, manipulation and uh, hidden secrets, it's not a good thing. Uh, it's a, it's, I think it's a Shakespearean quote, but I remember from this movie V for Vendetta. And in this time, in this political climate, I, 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 this statement always sticks out. Because the main character, V, said, actors lie to tell the truth. Politicians lie to conceal it. And I always love that line because that's all we're doing as actors and performers. We're lying, but we're doing it to reveal the truth. Boy, we know what the go- we know what's going on in the world of politics. We surely do. That's why I love Trump. Trump is show- <laughs> Trump is the Frankenstein monster that has now shown every politician what their process has become. They can't stop him because he's doing what they do. He, they can't stop him because he's doing what they've been doing for years, manipulating and deceiving people in order for them to get what they want. He is in their face, doing it in their face and doing it with so much contradiction. And every time somebody tries to do anything that is pragmatic, he re- he responds in political speak. And that's the same thing they've been doing. And so now they don't know how to respond. To they that. can't. It's their own system. Right, well, he's, be- he's beating. He's beating them at their own game. Exactly. And he's exposing it to oh, the public while he's doing it. I, I would it's not measurable. be surprised. I would not be surprised if someday he says I was performing the whole time. I, I would not be so. It's, he's just he's so perfect that it's almost like it's a performance. I mean, I look at him and Rush Limbaugh and go, because I know Rush Limbaugh and I know that uh, Michael Savage. I know their performance because I just know them. I I know of them and see them and go, oh, these guys are on a stage. Well, they're they're yes. all, they're laughing all their way to the bank. And so I look at Trump and think, oh, my God, this is really something. I, I mean, I don't know if he's performing or not, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, a few years down, down the, road, the road, he might go, that was the best one-man show that I toured <laughs> all across the country. <laughs> and I love it because, yeah, the political system is really is broken, and I think Trump is going to help us fix it. it we may go through some dark times if he's president, no doubt about it, but then everyone's going to have to get together and go, Okay, I think we now realize that it's a disease and we need to fix it. But that's how we are as people. We never, we're not very, we're not very proactive. We're very reactive in life, really. Yes, we are. So it's like he'll, very much. He'll break it, and then once he breaks it, they'll go, "Oh, I guess they were right. We probably should fix this." Yeah, yeah, it's broken now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all the great ones see a th- they, all the great ones see things ahead of time, which you know, and then and then, they're they're, ahead of their then, time. then everybody catches up. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. BJ, thank you for being with us on Oh, Truth My Story. pleasure, guys. My pleasure. I, I love what you guys are doing because it's, it's mm-hmm. see, voices like yours are out there, too. So that's why this world's a great place. It's not, there's voices everywhere and, and everyone's got a right voice for them. That's what's so cool. Uh, yeah, I agree. So if people want to find out more about BJ. Oh, God, do they? <laughs> I, well, <laughs> do they really? Um, the two or three that yeah, are Yeah, uh, well, uh, yeah, K- if you go to KISW.com, that's where I do my radio show every morning uh, in Seattle. Uh, do a little geeky podcast, too, which is yes. fun. It's, I, it's like a radio show saw, for geeks. I just saw five years now. It's been running. Yeah, I know. How crazy is that? And I, that's our passion project because we love geeky stuff. Uh, and we so we basically, it's instead of keeping up with the Kardashians, we keep up with the Lannisters, uh, which to me <laughs> nice. is just as nice. it's just as interesting, really, yeah. uh, if not and, more. And, and very sexy, too. Yeah, yeah. and you learn so yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, and and so, yeah, so that, that's bjgeeknation.com. It's on iTunes. It's everywhere. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I guess those two places are a good place to start. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much for being Thanks with Thanks for having us. me on, guys. Yeah. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you yeah. so much, BJ. Thank you for listening to True North Story, the series. Follow us on Twitter, at True North Story. And tune in next time for another True North Story.